Um, all right, so the first lady is a very, very tough act to follow, but we have quite a few firsts up here on stage um, with me right now. So um, please join me in welcoming <laughs> Ursula Burns and Megan Smith. And um, not that much background is needed, but Ursula Burns serves as chairwoman and CEO of Xerox. She is the first African-American woman CEO to head a Fortune 500 company. And another first, also the first woman to succeed another woman as head of a Fortune 500 company. <laughs> Megan Smith is the third Chief Technology Officer of the United States, but the first woman <laughs> CTO. And uh, she was previously a VP of Google X at Google, the VP of Business Development at Google for nine years, general manager of Google.org. That's a lot of Google, Megan. Yeah. Um, and the former CEO of Planet Out. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Um, so we have a lot of awesome high school girls here in the audience. And I wanted to start out, thank you guys for being here. I wanted to start out by having both of you take us back to your high school years. We do not have a time machine, sadly, but I'm going to set the scene for you. So I kind of, I just went and looked up a few things. So um, I'm going to start out with Ursula. When you were 16, barcode technology made its debut on a pack of Wrigley chewing gum. Did you know that? No. no. Um, People Magazine launched, Go Time Inc. I Love Lucy aired its series finale, and Richard Nixon resigned. I did know that. You did know that. OK, <laughs> Megan, your turn. OK. When you were 16, yes. And I'm not giving the years on purpose, but you can probably figure it out. Oh, you can um, figure it out. I'm yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. We're all smart here. Um, so the U.S. boycotted the Olympics in Moscow. The Iran-Iraq war started. And on a much lighter note, Iron Maiden's first album dropped. And in case Kathy Kennedy is still in the room, Star Wars Episode Five was released. Really? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So now we've we've set the we've set the time. I want you to both walk us through your high school years. What was your home life like? What were you into? What got you into STEM? Tell us about it. Ursula, can you start? So my home life, I was uh, I lived in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I went to a when I was 16, right? So yeah. lived in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in housing projects with my mother and my brother and my sister two-bedroom housing project with four people, so we figured it out. Four people, one bathroom. No wonder uh, you like space. You yeah, were just saying backstage space. that you need your space. Um, I, was, uh, I went to an all-girl Catholic high school. Mm -hmm. We were extremely poor, but my mother's focus was on, was on education, so all-girl Catholic high school. And I was really, and I'm an introvert, very much, I spent most of my time um, in the house reading or doing whatever you do when you're in the house. I um, wasn't into boys, all-girl Catholic high school, so we didn't <laughs> quite uh, get out to see boys too much. I was really good at math, and, um, or at least I thought I was really good at math. It was the, <laughs> it was the thing I was the best at, and I, in high school, actually started to f go down that path and just spend a lot of time in math, um, doing problems, thinking about science, that kind of stuff. And so it was a, kind of a the launching off point for me and understanding that that's kind of the career path I wanted to go down, not knowing that there was a thing called an engineer, because I didn't have any clue that they were engineers. You didn't know any engineers growing up? None. We had uh, absolutely none. You know, one of the things that's interesting that helps, and I'm going to get off this really quick, I was thinking about this when I was preparing, thinking about what I was going to say today. As a woman engineer in, a, in America, when I was in the 80s, early 80s when I started, you were alone and odd. And, one, and I was very, very well prepared for that. I was very well prepared for being alone. And I kind of felt very comfortable with it. So when I actually went down this career path and realized that there were not a lot of women there and there were not a lot of black people there and you had to do a lot of stuff by yourself at that point, it was pretty cool for me. So I, I fit right in. Awesome. <laughs> Megan, yeah. channel your 16-year-old self. 16-year-old. I was, uh, lived, grew up in Buffalo in the city. Which you uh, told me is also part of New York. But it's not part of the city. <laughs> it's on the other side, there's this Erie Canal uh, that used to go there. Um, I lived with my mom. Uh, by then, my older siblings were gone. Uh, and I would go to my dad's. Uh, some of the time, he lived in Canada with my stepmom, amazing family. Um, I was lucky to be in a school 
that was full of entrepreneurial teachers, even though we had no money. Uh, during the integration uh, times, these amazing magnet schools had been founded in Buffalo. So I went to the school, and so they invented, they, they made us do science fair, it was mandatory, which was critical for me. Uh, and so I learned, it's really hard, because you guys uh, you know, are taking science and math, and all, often you're having to learn the history of it, not really do it. I wish that we taught STEM like we teach PE that you would go and play and discover and make and get some instruction. Go and make and discover, and that's what science fair is like. I also, um, my parents were incredibly entrepreneurial. So my dad started the recycling center for Buffalo. And uh, at one point he actually was working with this kid and, he's, and he looked at him and said, you know, someday everybody's gonna do this. So they were sort of these visionary local people. My parents, my mom started the bicycle club for Western New York and organized uh, a race on the first Earth Day of a bike rider, a bus uh, a car commuter, and a walker. You know, just very social change people, um, all, all of that world. So I was around them. And then also, at one point, you reminded me in math, I had a teacher who made me feel like I was pretty bad at math. And what was lucky for me is I had the teacher the next year who I got 100 on my first test in trig, and he's like, why don't you do that again? And he kept pushing me, and I got 100 on every test that year because he expected it of me. Yeah. And he said I could do it. And then he and uh, it's a guy named uh, Barry Soffin, Mr. Soffin, and Mr. Keene together drafted kids for the math team. And so we would have never done that. But then we learned to play in the STEM area, which is one of the key things for getting kids into STEM. And I was lucky to have that happen for me. So it was an amazing experience. And again, you know, dealing with a lot of scarcity but solving things and being part of the community and being entrepreneurial all around, whether teachers, the community, and the times were amazing. You know, growing up as a kid uh, during the women's movement, uh, during, you know, sort of Nixon and post-Vietnam and all the things that happened. It was an extraordinary time in the country. Riots in America, race-wise. Yes. The big, <laughs> big, yeah, social and, change. And, and, and you're, you're both very passionate about um, getting more girls and, and women in STEM and, and more diversity in the field. Um, what, Megan, let's just start with you. Um, you've talked about the four things that are really crucial to getting girls and women interested in STEM mm -hmm. from the get-go. What, what are they? And they're key for anybody, but people who have figured it out already stay in, which tend to be the kids who the media is talking to, the, the white boys. Um, so first off is, like I was saying, trying it, right? <laughs> being in Y'all caught that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of muttered it, but yeah. yeah. Uh, being able to play in these fields and experience it and see that they're actually joyful. And the way we're teaching, we make you feel like they're boring or incredibly intimidating. And so it's just a, not the way to do it. We need to move to active learning. So play and try it. The second one is to know what it's for. Like technology, I don't know, you guys know, we're, we're in the old patent office right now. And uh, Michelle Lee is here, USPTO, uh, Patent and Trade Office. But, uh, Michelle, yes. stand up. Where are you? Yeah. Throw there. <laughs> so um, the Patent Office was founded in our country for uh, freedom. Because you can't have freedom without an economy. And you need STEM for an economy. And the other thing I'll just tell you since we're talking about it is Clara Barton was in this building. And she was in the second floor here. She's the first equally paid federal employee. They used to spin on her. She eventually was fired for being a woman. And she eventually came back under Lincoln and, of course, founded the Red Cross in this building. But just amazing history. But back to that. So understanding why we do this. You know, why, what's it for, and how's it exciting, how's it important. Third one is encouragement. Just people to suggest that you do this. And one of the things we really have to do is work with our kids of color, work with our girls, and really say, these, you know, when they tell us what they're taking, are you going to take a computer science class? You know, just make sure we're asking them. And the last one is to see, see yourself in the field. We do a lot of work on lost histories. Many people don't know. I'm going tomorrow to the Grace Hopper celebration. How many people in here have heard of Grace Hopper? Yes. So Grace Hopper is an Edison-level American who invented the idea of programming languages. So the idea of a translator or a compiler, so you write in an English thing, you eventually COBOL and now Java, all these things translated into machine code. Brilliant, Rear Admiral, Navy, uh, Rear Admiral in the Navy. So we need to know that she did this yeah. so that we know that women have always done computer science. <coughs> that kind of, those are four key things. And, and Ursula, what are you doing personally and um, through your platform at Xerox to get more girls, to get more diversity? In STEM. Yeah, I think the, I, I like 
Megan's four, I'll just either repeat a couple and then add a couple. One is this idea that it's open to everyone. So examples of, of what does an engineer look like? What does a scientist look like? It's amazing how many people would never believe that I was an engineer, actually still don't. Mm -hmm. um, and said, well, Do you, you still come across that? Yeah, oh, all the time, all the time. You, you're an engineer? Yeah, believe it or not, we know how to do math. And we, both, <laughs> both, both Megan and I have BS and MSs, BS is an MS is in mechanical engineering. We were just regular people who went to school. So first is examples, this idea that, that is accessible to everyone and you do not have to be weird or a nerd or uh -huh. super smart or anything. Second is economic. It's really a big deal. Just look at how much money an engineer, first of all, need, and that need is matched with an economic proposition that's amazing. So most um, high school students have no idea how much money they can make. Very solid, continuous, good living. Um, in an exciting area. So we have to make it a, an economic proposition stronger than we are today. And then the third is this idea that we call celebration all the time. You know, one of the things that I learned early when I was 16 or 17, somebody asked me who was the person, who won the Super Bowl? Mm -hmm. By the way, I didn't know at that point who won the Super Bowl, but I could easily find you out. You really stayed home a lot reading. I did. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't interesting. <laughs> but they also asked me who won the Nobel Prize for in, in physics, mm -hmm. and I, my, my question was, what the hell is the Nobel Prize? <laughs> and this idea that we have to celebrate things that are important to us, right? We celebrate a lot of things that are interesting and entertaining, but not necessarily earth-changing, world-changing. Right. And science is the foundation for most, science and engineering is the foundation for the, the solving most of the problems that we have, approaching most of the opportunities that we have. If you think about potable water, you think about health and health distribution, food and food distribution, you think about anything to do with cleanliness or climate or and it all has to do with engineers and scientists mm -hmm. and if you think about all the problems <coughs> the piles and piles of problems and you had all these piles of assets wouldn't you actually turn those assets toward those problems or opportunities mm -hmm. and we're turning more of the assets towards bouncing balls and throwing balls and hitting balls and you know all of these things that we do in sports and acting all neat stuff mm -hmm. all neat stuff and lawyers, I just think we have to actually get back to making stuff and thinking about that as important and celebrating that. Right. So. It's, um, um, this is an area that the, president, the president's really focused on. So, for example, next Monday we'll have Astronomy Night. And we have not only Astronomy Night at the White House, but 75 communities across uh, the country have already signed up to participate. So <clears throat> I hope you guys will join in. But it, it looks, you know, having the science fair winners come to the White House, which we do all the time, and he interacts with them, and we try to stand that up, making sure first robotics, doing the work of... Uh, first robotics. What, I'm, I love I'm, We're a founding member. It's amazing. Yes. First robotics, if you haven't participated in first robotics, you need to go to your regional. There's 73, 74 regionals around the country. Really cool. Um, just, to, again, play at this stuff. And then, uh, and then get the instruction. But also, um, we did the Inclusive Entrepreneurship Day with the President. We had 90 entrepreneurs from 30 countries, mm -hmm. or 30, sorry, companies from across the country, from Mississippi, from Wisconsin, not just the, the core entrepreneurial places, just showing you know, and standing up this, you guys were involved, the, what the companies were committing to, the visa. You guys is, is Xerox, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Xerox. How, Xerox a few there. of you, right? Yeah, just a couple a of us, yeah. I, we're, we're almost out of time because we, we want to get all of you fed and we have to get back to watch the debates, of course. Um, but I just wanted to end with one very quick question. So I, I went and talked to a few of the girls here um, because we don't have time to take questions from the audience. And I got three sample questions that they wanted to ask you. Sure. You each, you get to pick one and give a very concise answer. Okay. So here are the three that you get to pick from. Um, best advice someone ever gave to you. What do you like best about your job? And when will we have flying cars? Okay. Best advice. Okay. Not the flying cars. No huh? flying cars. Megan will take that one. Yes. <laughs> Google uh, X. Best advice. There is no substitute for hard work. Okay. Megan. I'm excited for flying cars. I cannot predict them when that would happen. But uh, I was lucky to take acoustics from Professor Bose, uh, and he was amazing. And the advice that he gave us, which I love, is uh, follow your passion. And so it was great to hear you guys talking about what you want to be, what you want to do. And the diversity of what you want to do is so awesome that we can cover all the bases. And if people really listen to their heart and they work hard, I think we'll do extraordinary things and solve the problems there. Um, the last thing I'll say is just that since the first lady was here, just in the Let Girls Learn initiative, it's not just about 
books than learning. It's about making in STEM and all this. And in fact, I was lucky. I had the honor to work closely with Malala Yousafzai. And her favorite subject is physics. So let's make sure all the girls all over 62 million thing. girls can learn physics too. One and make flying cars. I'm going to get kicked off, so you have to okay. Real seconds. quick, this is not only a requirement or initiative that, can, that has to be led at the president's level. Mm -hmm. We all live in communities, and you just walk outside of our community and go to the community next to you that's not as affluent, mm -hmm. and just engage. Yep. It's a big thing. It's one of the things that we do. Just engage. I find a school, find a student, just get engaged. I like to call that a take your neighbor's kid to work day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. I wish we had more time. We really appreciate you being here.